Today we're going to do the second part of our ecosystem structure and function notes. You should have your lecture notes with you and feel free to pause the video as you complete them or to watch the video through one time and then write the second time. Last lecture we talked a lot about how we can define different components of the ecosystem into abiotic or biotic. Today we're going to talk about energy flow or how sunlight energy allows interactions within the ecosystems and then what that looks like in nature when we go out to try and find evidence of that. I need you to know a certain bit of vocabulary so that you can access literature or online resources. Um, you should know from biology last year that producers like trees and green plants and algae trap the sunlight energy and transfer Producers trap the sunlight energy and transfer them on to other consumers. You should know this vocabulary already and that we lump the broad group of organisms that help um, tear apart waste, wasted matter like um, you know, decaying logs or um, you know, the flesh of uh, animals, that we lump those all into the decomposers. But actually there's much more specific categories that we could get into. Shredders, detritivores, and we'll talk a little bit about that um, when we go out to visit our stream um, ecosystem. There's another uh, set of terms that you should be familiar with and that is the trophic levels. Make sure you can label your diagram with the first, second, third trophic level. Um, and it goes on from here, especially when you're in marine ecosystems, you can get up um, well past uh, what we've labeled. For any of these, um, for any of this terminology, there are certain li limitations because we've oversimplified the relationships so that we can understand them, so that we can discuss them. Um, this is a really great video I'd like you to watch and think through the vocabulary. If any one of these groups had been successful, how would you have um, categorized them on the diagram before? You can't watch this straight from this lecture, but you can watch it on a link from our Google Classroom or also on the website. Okay, there's certain limitations I really want you to be able to identify when we're talking about feeding relationships. And one of that is that the typical food chain where a lot of that terminology that we just discussed comes from is a really oversimplified model. So a food web is much more accurate um, because multiple organisms could feed on um, the first level consumers. And those that occupy um, higher trophic levels are going to have bigger impacts if, oftentimes, this is not always the case, but oftentimes if they're eliminated from the ecosystem. So one limitation that you should write down is that um, food chains are an oversimplification. Some other clarifications are that, especially in aquatic ecosystems, many producers are invisible to the naked eye. So while they're trapping sunlight energy, um, and they, they're not something that you're going to identify with like grass or trees or crops. So these diatoms and algaes, they're really important um, bases to ecosystem or to food chains and ecosystems, but they're not something that we think of as a terrestrial animal. Um, second limitation or clarification I want to talk about is humans do not always occupy the top spot in the food chain. Many humans across the world are actually herbivores. Occasionally, um, you know, when they uh, have the resources in their area, they might eat other herbivores, like we eat cows, or they might eat fish. Um, and our trophic level, level varies widely depending on what location you're in. Um, so often forgotten is this third one that decomposers really interact or interconnect all the different trophic levels and are essential to ecosystems and recycling the um, nutrients that are trapped in the tissues of organisms. In addition to the nutrients that they release back into the environment, um, they also, you know, utilize and capitalize on energy that otherwise would be wasted to the ecosystem. Um, we've talked a little bit about how food chains are an oversimplified model. Um, and we're going to talk in just a moment about the difference between transformations and transfers. So I'd like you to record that part of the incredible job of producers 
is to change this light energy and transform it from physical into chemical. Without that original transformation, all the other parts of the food web um, would collapse. Then the role from that point on it, for consumers, whether they're primary consumers, secondary, and on, is that they transfer the energy and the nutrients um, along through the food web. So this guy right here, he's not adapted to be eating grass or grain. And so he really relies on the herbivore to pass that energy along. So we'll talk about transform and, and, and transfer a little bit. Transformations are the conversion of energy um, or a change in state. Okay, so if you change like gas to a liquid or liquids to solid. And then transfers are exactly what they sound like. They're movement um, through an ecosystem or sometimes out of an ecosystem. So IB um, testers really need to pay attention to these two terms. Um, they come up again when we talk about the productivity of an ecosystem or we talk about the ecosystem as an enclosed system and what leaves and enters that system. So practice it here for just a moment. You can pause the video and try and put these five um, situations into the table in your notes and try and figure out if they're a transfer so that the energy doesn't actually change um, state or if they're um, a transformation um, like is the case in photosynthesis when light energy is transformed into chemical energy. Okay, so to summarize, feeding relationships allow energy to be transformed from the sunlight energy and transferred from producers and consumers upward, um, but also lost. And we're going to talk a little bit about that in, in a little bit. When we say lost, we're only focusing on this system. I mean, it's not destroyed permanently. It just escapes the system and can't be moving through the food web any longer. Um, on your notes here, um, one of the major things you really need to understand are the major inputs in the transformation occurring during photosynthesis. So this is really simple and it should be a review from biology, but the sunlight energy, um, carbon dioxide, and water um, are used to create uh, glucose and oxygen. And this is an oversimplification of this process, but this is as far as we need to go today. Um, and then what is nice about this whole system is that when you get into respiration, um, you use some of those same products as inputs. So now we're going to use glucose um, and oxygen, and we're going to give off energy, and we're going to have water escape, and carbon dioxide. So the waste present in respiration, or the outputs, are the same as the inputs in photosynthesis. So respiration um, is a transfer of energy, okay? It is not a transformation. Um, and that glucose is then usable, um, and much, much of it is given off as heat um, because we're not very efficient. So let's talk about that heat a little bit. Um, all food chains are going to be, begin with sunlight energy, and at each step as they move along, a certain percentage is lost. Can you remember what that percentage is from bio? So about 90% is lost as heat or waste at each transfer in a food web. So where does that go? Um, well, see, let's think, oh, before we talk about where it goes, let's think a little bit about of the tiny uh, percentage of sunlight energy that's actually reaching the plants and stored in their chlor chloroplasts, okay? Of all of that, and it's a pretty small percentage of everything that comes into the earth, only 2% is stored in the sunlight energy. So if, it's, if only 2% is stored in this plant, and then that has to be transferred to the producers, I mean to the consumers and the secondary consumers and et cetera, where does that 98% go? Well, most energy at every step is given off as heat or it's given off um, as waste. So um, if you start with about 100 kilocalories of sunlight energy, um, and 2% is stored in the plant's biomass, then you can just imagine as that transfers up and only 10% of that it moves on to the um, consumer, we don't get a lot of each step. 
um, that moves through. This is due to the second law of thermodynamics. So it's important to remember when we're talking about lost that it's not destroyed, it just changes form. And so when, the, when consumers take in producers and they're not very efficient at um, accessing that you know, biomass, the energy trapped in, in that plant, a lot of it um, is used as heat to, to function. Some of it's given off in waste. Um, and the amount given off in waste depends on what kind of um, organism you are and how you're adapted. Oops. Let's go back to that slide. And the second law of thermodynamics talks about how energy goes from concentrated sunlight into dispersed heat. And so this just means that there's going to be um, more disorder as we go on from this really um, concentrated energy. All right, let's quickly talk about um, some ways we can see these feeding relationships in nature. We can go to an ecosystem and we can collect the organisms and we can look at um, this loss of energy um, by graphing them in a pyramid of numbers or in a pyramid of biomass. And I say snapshots up here, it's really important to remember that this is just one moment in time. And if you come back and visit in a different season or a different day or after a different event, it might be different. But let's take a look. Pyramid of numbers are the total number of species for each trophic level. The length of each bark is a relative proportion, and it's helpful in comparing populations over time. So you could come, you know, and look at spring versus summer um, for this ecosystem in the prairie. Pyramid of biomass is you go into an ecosystem, you collect all the organisms, and you it's the dry mass, so without water to bias it. And it can be for different scales, okay, but oftentimes, um, you know, it's, it's for um, all the species in an area that you can count and, and collect. And it's not quite as biased for um, large organisms, which we'll see in a second. So here's the prairie ecosystem, and here's the marine ecosystem. And this is what I mean by snapshots. If you collect all of these guys at one time in a marine ecosystem, you see the producers are actually fewer than the consumers. And you're like, wait a second, this doesn't make sense. I just learned that 90% of energy is lost as heat or waste, so we can't have more in the second trophic level than the first. This is because the phytoplankton reproduce so quickly that, oh, there's a little typo there, that they, can't, they can actually support more zooplankton, which reproduce more slowly. So in a terrestrial and aquatic ecosystem, this might be different. And also take a look at this little puzzle and see if you can identify which is the uh, biomass um, pyramid of numbers and which one, I'm sorry, which is the pyramid of numbers and which one's the pyramid of biomass. It's actually this guy right here is the numbers. And this is the biomass. This pyramid accounts for one large tree, which because of its ginormous size can handle many herbivores and those can handle some carnivores and some top carnivores. Here, when it's the biomass, you can more accurately see that this one species, or one individual actually, um, supports so many other trophic levels. So there's limitations on 48 and 50 in your textbook. I highly suggest you go over it. They have a great um, set of images and explanations.